I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our live talk on colorectal cancer and integrative oncology with Dr. Sadrul Sadat. Uh, Dr. Sadrul Sadat will discuss prevention, risk factors, and support for treatment optimization. This talk is for informational purposes only. Dr. Sadrul Sadat will speak in general terms and is not dispensing medical treatment. Folks who are interested are encouraged to schedule a comprehensive visit with him. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Payman Sadrul Sadat is a highly skilled naturopath with over 20 years of integrative medical experience. He is trilingual and has a wealth of experience and medical training spanning multiple disciplines from around the world, holding licensing in China, Iran, Canada, and the United States. Dr. Sadrul Sadat's areas of focus include integrative cancer treatment, mistletoe therapy, chronic disease, mold, candida, Lyme disease, co-infections, chronic fatigue, and more. He is a licensed board certified doctor of naturopathic medicine and on the faculty of Virginia University of Integrative Medicine. His deep knowledge of conventional complementary and integrative medicine allow him to think deeply and find solutions for his patient's health. His approach is always very gentle and specific to each patient's personal needs, and I'm sure you'll see this for yourself. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sadrul Sadat, who will now present and then after open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, hello, everyone. Uh, now very excited to uh, discuss about health and this, this topic for today about the colorectal cancer. This is actually uh, the, the same presentation that I had uh, uh, for Johns Hopkins uh, colorectal cancer uh, continuing education that was on uh, April, uh, sorry, that was on February uh, 8th and 9th. So the first day was basically for like the, the morning of 8th was for patient education and then the afternoon and 9th were for basically uh, medical doctors. So uh, the lectures were uh, geared toward continuing education. So I was uh, uh, fortunate to present there and this is the exact same uh, discussion um, that uh, I, I did there. So that's basically sharing with you guys. So I start with sharing my screen and uh, as we have a smaller group, uh, obviously if you have any question, you can interrupt me. Uh, during this presentation. So uh, the the discussion about the uh, integrative medicine for gastrointestinal cancers and probably about the focus on uh, the, the colorectal cancer. Uh, just a little bit of uh, discussion about what uh, is the idea of the integrative medicine. Uh, this, uh, the practice of integrative medicine um, uh, started from uh, the nature that was not much evidence-based and now moving towards the very evidence-based uh, uh, discussions with the alternative, whatever we have as, let's say, diet, lifestyle, supplementation, uh, optimizing optimizing health, whatever the discussion is, it should be uh, evidence-based. And that's basically what I consider for my approach. And um, uh, because when, we, when it comes to the field of basically integrative medicine and uh, naturopathy, uh, then uh, many people may not know the difference between a naturopath and a naturopath doctor. Like a naturopath is basically anyone who, ha who has an interest in alternative medicine, some education, probably a certificate course, uh, but uh, a naturopathic doctor is basically, uh, has an intense training four year, intense training after a bachelor degree they need a they they have to have a license to practice and uh, uh, like the difference is like just one word like naturopath and naturopath doctor but the the difference is naturopath doctor actually studies about the evidence based approaches um so the focus uh for for like this discussion is basically over the gi cancer what we can do to support uh, uh, our patients care. 
Uh, normally, uh, when we have our first session, we always talk about the foundation, like the, the role of the diet and lifestyle, which is basically done usually in the first session if needed. Um, and there is a uh, kind of condition that should be addressed in terms of diet or lifestyle, and that is lingering, that will be continued on sessions after. But usually cleaning diet, um, certain practices and lifestyle changes that need to be is usually discussed in the first intake, uh, a 90 minute, like an hour and a half or sometimes longer, but it's usually those those um, amount of time that is spent to discuss very in detail, um, uh, what is a typical diet, what are the certain practices, um, uh, we, we go with a very typical daily, like 24 hour intake and uh, things that actually can be very important uh, to say with regards to the colorectal cancer, it can be any cancer, but especially to the colorectal cancer, the discussions about like, how is the bowel movement? Um, how much is the amount of sugar in diet and what we call high glycemic index type of food, like uh, things that are very sugary in nature. Uh, the way that uh, the basically uh, research supports the inflammation happening following the very sugary uh, uh, stuff like treats and uh, like candy, uh, basically those type of discussion. And I was uh, try to highlight this, that this is different from carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are necessary. Carbohydrates give you the calorie give you the energy for the day, uh, especially like more complex carbohydrates. But if it's more like a simple, like a very sugary, uh, and again, like what is called high glycemic index uh, type of food, then uh, that would be um, kind of causing the inflammation. The, the, the way that is, is usually or easier discussed in uh, alternative medicine, it says that the sugar feeds the cancer cells or the bad cells. So these are all the discussions that, that is done in that uh, session, in the first session, usually. We also discuss like the uh, the meat, the, the amount of the red meat, the, again, like with very specific about the colorectal cancer. This is something we want to make sure that the amount of the red meat and the, also the way that it is prepared, like if it's like charred meat and uh, kind of burned on, on direct um, uh, exposure to uh, fire, then that can be, a, that's a known risk factor for, for the colorectal cancer. Uh, we also would like to know the level of uh, physical activity. There are tons of evidence about uh, the exercise, how it can change the um, uh, basically prognosis down the road after there is a such, there is such a diagnosis of colorectal cancer. What is the level of physical activity? Usually what is referred to as 150 minutes per, per week, if you make it simple, half an hour per day for five days of a week. And that is uh, what is called moderately intense um, physical activity. So uh, it will be very ideal that physical activity ends with slight sweating, but even if not, even if that's not possible, at least just being active, just moving around, walking, and uh, that would be uh, necessary for the uh, basically optimizing the treatment. So again, like there are articles supporting that. So all these will be discussed. Um, again, like if there is, um, uh, let's say smoking, um, alcohol intake, def definitely these are things to, uh, as much as possible uh, should be cleaned uh, from the diet. So uh, what we do is basically an integrative approach, um, like, like that is ideal setting for uh, any type of discussion about uh, integrative oncology, but also with the specific about the colorectal cancer. Uh, the way that we always fo focus on the body and on the physic, and uh, probably less remember that the body and mind are connected. Uh, so this is what we try to make sure that like the amount of stress a person is tolerating um, that that is 100% understandable. Imagine all the uh, visits, the meetings, the appointments, the treatments, the sessions, 
uh, that is a lot bringing for the patient and it should be a way that is practical. So sessions of mindfulness, meditation, yoga, acupuncture, these are all uh, things that can uh, help with basically optimizing the treatment and tolerating, making it like more practical for the individual to, to receive all the treatments. And uh, we, we try to make a patient-centered uh, approach. So it's basically... Uh, when we consider the body and mind together, we are treating the individual. We're not treating the disease only. So it should be uh, obviously to to hear what are patients' preferences, right? We we need to adjust our treatments to uh, basically situation that the the patient has, and not just strictly and rigidly following the protocols. It should be practical, or as much as possible, we move to that direction. So this is what we call patient center. We treat the patient, not just a name of a disease. And uh, this is again, like for, we can discuss it for all type of cancer, but more specifically when it comes to the colorectal and the, the GI. Um, another thing that uh, is done with the uh, kind of regular uh, practice, re regular sessions of uh, integrative oncology is that we do a lot of testing. So lab testing to get more information uh, especially about the nutritional uh, status of uh, of our patients. And there are tests that are basically called uh, specialty labs. Um, so specialty tests, let's say the NutriVal, uh, that can be a very detailed information. I always say it's a, do it's a deep dive into the biochemistry of the body in terms of the amount of vitamins. And that is a very breakdown, like a detailed breakdown of the vitamins. Um, the the antioxidants like the the report has basically five categories to discuss uh, the oxidative stress how much is uh, that is the case inflammation heavy metal toxicity the methylation problem and the mitochondrial support so it's a basically 13 14 page report uh, which gives us a lot of good information about how is the nutritional status of uh, the protein consumption protein intake is there any deficiency quite often we find out that uh, uh, there are certain amino acids that are not enough in the body because this is a blood and urine test so they they check what is in the blood also the metabolites in the urine. And uh, uh, again, like we benefit from all these, what is called specialty testing. Um, the discussion about um, candida infection is another thing uh, which is important, uh, especially in DMV area, uh, the, the humidity, uh, which, which, is, uh, which plays a role if you talk about the uh, mold uh, growth inside home. So if you just open a cabinet and you see a mold under the sink, uh, that is usual, but also the same kind of type of microorganism, like the fungus, the way it grows inside our body and makes the candida infection. So there are ways to test that. Uh, the IgG, IgM, IgA testing of the candida, normally done by the ALA test. This is another thing I always try to Make sure that, that at least uh, the infection is not going on. Is infection, is candida infection the cause of the cancer? Uh, it would be a not direct link. The bottom line is it will take some power of the immune system, the way that there is an infection happening in the body. Um, it will take some power of the uh, immune system dealing with the infection and killing the microorganisms, which can be helped, which can be supported. Uh, and that is like the bottom line. But if you talk about like, yeah, like secretory IgA in the test is really high. And now we are talking about the lining of the digestive system that kind of makes a connection there. So there are things that we want to make sure that they are uh, not the case, kind of ruling them out. And if, if, if that is the case, uh, then the proper treatment should be given. So uh, with that, uh, that would be on top of uh, the, the regular uh, lab analysis, like when you go to your doctor, to your primary care, usually the lab corp is the um, test, like kidney function test, liver function test, um, and uh, the CBC, 
comprehensive uh, 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 blood panel, uh, cholesterol. So we do them, of course, or if you have tests from your provider, which is done like in the past couple of months, that would be good enough. But we still, we would like to see more stuff uh, with regards to the um, basically immunoglobulins. What are the levels of the immunoglobulins? Is Lyme disease a condition? Uh, again, like in DMV area and definitely in many parts of the nation, Lyme uh, plays a, a role in terms of uh, chronic diseases. So these are all uh, tests um, that are done. And uh, again, like food sensitivity, uh, what are the triggers in food? And uh, that might be something we actually eat on a regular basis um, and uh, it's in our food. Uh, it's not causing an allergy and kind of a strong reaction as people usually refer to like peanut allergy or like very high sensitivity of um, uh, food allergy. It's just something that the immune system may show a reaction and that reaction would be sort of some sort of inflammation. So is it a peanut? Is it uh, egg? Is it the dairy product? Like the top, if you say number of the top items that usually cause the um, hypersensitivity, usually dairy product, that's a big one. The gluten discussion about gluten, a lot of people cannot tolerate that well. Then the eggs and the nuts. So four major, if you say allergens or like the, the, the food items that cause uh, some higher level of sensitivity, these will be discussed. So we have ways to test them and um, that's how we uh, basically uh, get our information on top of the regular uh, testing. The other thing that, that is very important and I have a slip separate slide on that is the vitamin D levels like serum vitamin D. And actually we had a session on serum vitamin D uh, discussion, how, how that is important for general health and also with regards to the oncology. So uh, um, normally this is not a common test done by the primary care providers. Why? Because um, everyone is deficient in vitamin D. Everyone has to take vitamin D. So this is like a very um, reasonable answer or I should say not a very reasonable answer that you may get from the primary care, but uh, the reality is uh, your primary care can, can check your serum level of vitamin D. We can do that. So we would like to know this because uh, again, like I have a separate slide on that, but not only there is a link between low level of vitamin D and the uh, diagnosis of um, basically cancer, but also down the road with the treatments that are provided with all the chemo, with all the surgery, there are research and evidence shown to say that if the level of vitamin D is optimized, the results are better. The prognosis is actually better. And uh, it's just interesting, more and more we do the testing, we see people are uh, like their serum levels are less than what it should be. An interesting thing is the range is really wide from 30 to 100. So I always say if your number comes back at 31, then you hear that, yes, your vitamin D is in the normal range. Um, but the question is, is that an optimum number? So we don't consider 31 as an optimum number for especially a case of uh, uh, integrative oncology diagnosis. Diagnosis. So we would like to see the number at uh, the, the basically more toward the middle toward the higher end of the normal range. So I have a separate slide on that and I'll get back to that. Let's see what else we do. Um, we try to optimize immune uh, system and uh, the, the discussion here uh, can be at the very end, it is your immune system that will find the bad cells here and there and clean them from the system. So how much your immune system is optimized how much immune system is functioning well, especially the type of cells. This is like what we would like to uh, kind of highlight that. The type of cells that are targeting the uh, cancer cells. So let's say the natural killer cells. Uh, we have tests to uh, to kind of see the ratio between the, the type of cells that make the antibodies, the type of cells uh, that uh, have a character of um, like cytotoxic, uh, basically T cells and natural killer cells. So we would like to see that the immune system is in a balanced 
And if not, then we have ways to address it. So I don't know if you have heard about the term immunomodulator, which is basically conditions or supplements or practices that actually modulates, like balances the, the immune system. If immune system is too active, it brings it down. If immune system is uh, less active, it just balances. And even with the supplements that is given, uh, the type of cells that we want to be more active or more balanced, we can do that. So uh, some of the immunomodulating uh, supplements or practices, number one, again, optimizing the level of vitamin D. Number two, you can discuss the uh, curcumin, the, the turmeric. You can also discuss, um, um, again, like the we discussed the vitamin D, but also the mushrooms, another immunomodulator, uh, that's the mushrooms. It's important, this discussion is very important because uh, we, we need to make sure if you are on uh, immunotherapy medications, there is no interaction between this type of practice and your immunotherapy uh, medication. Now, back to what we can do to basically optimize your immune system and uh, I should say the top, the two big topics in alternative medicine. Number one is high dose vitamin C. And the second one is the mistletoe So for high dose vitamin C, I think this is the topic that is more um, heard about. This is uh, uh, probably a, more of a common practice. I know certain uh, uh, oncologists, actually, they, uh, they have incorporated the the practice of high dose vitamin C with their regular, um, uh, basically, chemotherapy. I have patients that they receive the vitamin C in this session with their chemo from like prescribed by their uh, oncologist. So I just want to say this is more uh, more understood from a medical system, and uh, uh, actually we do have that in. In, at, at Naya. So what we do is basically to make sure that uh, the practice of vitamin C is safe, because that is the number one. And with that, um, it would be uh, checking a certain enzyme, like it's a G6PD and the, the kidney function test, because the vitamin D, the uh, vitamin C will be flushed out of the body through the kidney. So we do the, those checks, which is basically blood sample, blood blood test. And if, if that is just normal, that is well in the range, uh, then we can start the uh, gradual increase of the vitamin C. Well, how does it work? Uh, when, when there is high dose of vitamin C infused uh, to the body, there is production of the hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide H2O2. This is something that the cells, our body cells do not like. This is something that our body cells will suffer but mostly cancer cells, mostly cells that do not have a stable DNA. So the ideal practice is that during the 45 minutes to one hour that the vitamin C is flushed out of the body through the kidneys, the bad cells die. So we have this as a, uh, again, like very uh, well understood practice and we, we, we do provide that at Naya. Uh, there's a gradual increase usually from 25 uh, grams up to, um, usually we, we stop at 75 or some of our patients can, can go up higher. Um, there is a question, I'm doing um, chemotherapy, should I do the vitamin C at the same time, yes or no? Um, what I'm saying, and still a lot of a lot of clinics do that, they, they say, yeah, no problem. You can do the vitamin C high dose with the chemotherapy. Last year, summer, there was an article published and they, they kind of highlighted the conclusion was that there is no benefit and actually the high dose of vitamin C may have a negative impact during the time of chemotherapy. Uh, so both, both ideas are there. Still probably majority of clinics practice that. Um, some clinics that follow, strictly follow the articles, uh, they, they may not uh, do that. But the thing is, um, uh, we can still move it around, like uh, during the timing of the uh, sessions of the, let's say, chemotherapy, if the time that they are infused, kind of we can still move the vitamin C uh, 
uh, out or separate the timing of the infusion to the level that the both both um, um, kind of infusions can be done and safe. So this is one, and then the other kind of again hot topic I should say uh, is the mistletoe therapy. And uh, with mistletoe, uh, again, what is this? This is the herb, but now it's kind of extracted in a vial, and it can be. Uh, injected to the body or infused as a serum. Um, last year, uh, so mistletoe is widely practiced in in uh, basically in the world. Uh, uh, it's I think over a hundred years that the, the practice has been kind of done in in Ger in um, Europe, Germany, Switzerland. It's so popular that their oncologists they start. Uh, the mistletoe therapy with the, uh, just like right after the diagnosis, the good thing about the mistletoe therapy is that it has least interactions. And I'm saying least because there are certain things that we still, we have to check, but the, the mistletoe therapy can, can actually be done very well or combined very well with the uh, other uh, uh, practices that the person is receiving. It's mentioned that you can even do it in the morning of the surgery, the day of the surgery. So it's not anything that can be concerning. However, there are still uh, certain conditions that we have to check. One of them is the autoimmune system, autoimmune diseases, and especially if the autoimmune disease is a flare. Still, we have uh, um, conditions that we can do the mistletoe therapy with, uh, with the autoimmune diseases. So back to the discussion, always there was a comment. We don't have a North American data. The, the practice is done widely in, in um, Europe, but we don't have North American data until uh, the Johns Hopkins um, uh, started a, a research and it, it took like seven years and the, the results was actually published last year, February. And um, uh, it was very promising. That was phase one. And uh, now they are planning for phase two and phase three. If the three phases are complete, then uh, the plan is that the mistletoe is uh, approved by uh, the the insurance company, like like by FDA and kind of you know, accepted by the insurance company. How many more years we have to wait? I don't know. Um, and at the end, would it be something that the big pharma will be happy about a treatment that is natural? much cheaper than the uh, chemotherapeutic and uh, like agents. Uh, so th there is a long way to, to reach to that point, but at least the first phase, and you can you guys can search on that, uh, the Johns Hopkins um, uh, study on mistletoe, February, 2023. You can just find that easily on, on Google. So it was promising and it was all end stage disease uh, by patients who were not treated with other modalities. So they all, were received mistletoe. The practice there was the IV infusion, and it was done like three times per week. Whereas normally the practice, what we do is the once a week uh, for for infusion. And a lot of times we combine it with the subcutaneous. So I just want to say that the mistletoe, uh, from the very basic um, kind of uh, evidence based uh, result, people feel better in terms of energy. A lot of people feel better with the mistletoe when they are on chemotherapy in terms of tolerating the uh, side effects of the chemotherapy, the way that it stimulates the bone marrow, the way that the, uh, it doesn't let the, the white blood cells drop significantly because it stimulates the immune system. And uh, even uh, with with that, like the red blood cells and the platelets, a lot of, uh, a lot of cases feel better with uh, like the, the drop is not significant. And um, uh, yeah, like the, the 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 practice, this is like evidence based. What is what we see all the way to the anecdotal anecdotal reports. You may read that uh, the mistletoe actually cleared everything. And um, um, I have uh, one patient. Basically, it's not colorectal; it's the uh, breast cancer, but. Um, she she has a metastasis, bone metastasis, and she. Uh, she was on um, uh, chemotherapy, and unfortunately, the, the all the markers uh, for the breast cancer and the, the bone metastasis were increasing. We started the mistletoe, and uh, still there was not a huge change. And then uh, I added a second 
uh, mistletoe and uh, significantly the markers started like with that change markers started to to drop um, it's it's something like game changer for that patient every member of the family is so happy and I'm planning to make it as a case report hopefully when the test results and even 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 if it's just like for now uh, still it's worth to to discuss it the way that the mistletoe had such a a significant uh, response. So again, I'm not saying it was only from the mistletoe, the person was on chemo, but the fact that uh, still on chemo, the markers were increasing now with that change, it stopped to drop. Well, we can say that the mistletoe had a role in, in this kind of significant improvement. So uh, make this kind of short, yeah, like vitamin C and um, the, the mistletoe, which actually we provide both of them at Naya are the two modalities, probably the top modalities in the alternative medicine world. And again, this is the good thing is they are natural, they're not toxic. And uh, uh, obviously when there's something is toxic, there is more side effects to that. So that is one thing. And then the nutritional, which comes from uh, the, the understanding from what are the deficiencies in the body, um, what are the uh, different types of supplementation that should be given. And uh, not only, uh, like a lot of my practice, like a lot of my patients, um, they they are, uh, they, they receive the conventional medicine. Like I have uh, not many, I should say few patients, they say I do not want to, to try the conventional route, but majority of my patients are uh, either planning for the surgery or planning for the um, chemo or are receiving chemo or immunotherapy. Now they want to do what they can to add to this practice. So that is like the regular practice. So we do a lot of supplementation for the phase um, that the patient is and um, basically um, uh, like uh, optimizing health for, for the time that they are receiving the certain treatment. If it's past all treatments, conditions is stable, now we adjust it, adjust the supplements to, to their face. So this is uh, for, especially for the GI cancer. Um, one of the common problems that happens uh, during the, the chemotherapy is basically the neuropathy. And uh, I put a couple kind of slides with uh, what we can do to, to reduce the level of the neuropathy. All the uh, kind of uh, uh, text here are coming from the, um, from the research, like all of the slides, they have the, the research uh, that. So for alpha lipoic acid, Actually, uh, this is one of the best supplements that can, uh, by, by evidence and by what we see in practice, it kind of reduces the uh, peripheral neuropathy. And uh, um, uh, not only this, like let's say if the peripheral neuropathy is coming from a diabetes, so still patients will benefit. If you say the bottom line is the alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant and kind of reduces the toxicity and the interesting, I mean, the not interesting thing, but the, the reality for chemotherapy is that the toxicity is accumulative. So over the time, the more number of sessions of the chemo that is done, even if it's not in the beginning, uh, down the road with the accumulation of the toxicity, the, um, the, the neuropathy can happen. So whatever we can practice to reduce it, because that sometimes can be the cause of uh, quitting the ter therapy. So uh, if we can do something that kind of minimize or uh, reduces the neuropathy, that would be a benefit for the treatment, for the chemother chemotherapy treatment. So that is a type of practice, alpha lipoic acid. Uh, uh, another uh, example for um, kind of supplements that can help with the neuropathy is the uh, L-acetylcarnitine. And uh, again, like that, that is also another type of um, uh, antioxidant and um, like usually two to three grams per day can, can help very well. Different types of supplements that can be um, um, prescribed for, for the, uh, for alpha lipoic acid and uh, acetyl L-carnitine. The other practice that is great and so much of evidence uh, about is the acupuncture, practice of acupuncture. Uh, 
there was a, uh, imagine a trial, like uh, 386 cancer patients from six uh, randomized control were kind of evaluated. And then the meta-analysis, which is basically one of the highest uh, level of basically the top level of evidence. It just shows that acupuncture led to significant improvements in pain scores and nervous system symptoms uh, based on the assessment that they do, the, the questionnaire that they provide. Like usually with the meta-analysis, uh, the uh, uh, kind of conclusion is usually very conservative, like further studies needed to confirm this. We found some good results, but then the way that it says significant improvement in the uh, basically uh, nervous system symptoms and the neuropathy, that is promising. Now, when it comes to, maybe I stop uh, my screen, when it comes to acupuncture, a um, uh, lot of lot of my patients actually have tried. I went to an acupuncturist. I didn't like it. Didn't work for me. I didn't like the practice. Uh, this is the thing. If you have done acupuncture um, and it was not kind of the right practice, change the practitioner. Acupuncture is something that is very much dependent on the style, on the type of practice. And um, if you have a practitioner who puts a lot of needles, because I'm saying this because I teach acupuncture in acupuncture school, and actually I did for about 12 years, tons of acupuncture when I was in Canada. So um, yeah, like acupuncture is a safe modality. If you feel that the practice was not right, maybe it's the type of practice like the style of the practitioner. If they put like 30 plus needles in your body, that may not be the right practice. If they put uh, uh, thick needles and do a lot of a stimulation, what is called uh, basically lift and thrust and clockwise, counterclockwise kind of rotations, and you feel kind of feeling hurt, that might be uh, probably the, not the right practice for you. Just change to your practitioner. And um, a lot of times there, you will see a def, def, different uh, with, with the results. The regular practice is the placing needles in between the webs of the hand, but also some of the kind of further uh, distal over the lower extremities. And uh, the way that acupuncture is discussed from Chinese medicine perspective, it's kind of balancing the body, the balancing the energies. Like the, there are kind of meridians considered in the body, the, the energy travels in those directions and the, the bad energy is balanced. Um, so, um, I was trying to give a lot of credit to the practice of acupuncture. Good things about the acupuncture, it's a safe modality. There is zero, zero uh, interaction with any procedure that is a person is doing like su surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. There's zero basically. And uh, again, like it would be very much dependent on the uh, style and type of the practitioner, style of the practice. Uh, B vitamins, another uh, great practice for uh, addressing the neuropathy. Usually B6 is uh, the, uh, the one that has been prescribed uh, more. And usually we go with a higher dosage. Um, if like usually there is 50 uh, uh, milligram uh, of the vitamin B in your capsule, then it might we might need to increase it, um, let's say, couple times of that to help with the neuropathy. So if you take a regular B, uh, then we might need to optimize it for the dose that we want. Uh, or if you are taking a, a B vitamin and also you are receiving the Myers cocktail infusion. What is Myers cocktail? It has all different types of B vitamin, B1, B2, B3, B5, B9, B12, plus more stuff, calcium gluconate, uh, magnesium, small doses of a vitamin C, uh, but uh, the the uh, practice of basically Myers cocktail, uh, people just feel re relaxed and refreshed and kind of more energized. And uh, like, again, like the outside of this discussion, a lot of people just for maintaining health, they, they receive the Myers cocktail, better sleep. Like when you optimize the level of B vitamin, the sleep is better less stress, less tension in the body. And now with our kind of discussion about the neuropathy, we have the evidence here that the, the practice kind of uh, was the, to some extent supportive and that's what we try to optimize.
I talked uh, a little bit about the vitamin D in the beginning, and now that was a general discussion. Now we would like to uh, make it even more specific for the neuropathy. You see that here. Um, uh, so it says vitamin D deficiency may be an easily detected, uh, basically peripheral neuropathy risk factor that could be resolved prior to the treatment to prevent the peripheral uh, neuropathy, uh, avoid treatment disruptions and improve treatment outcomes. So um, again, you know, practitioners are sometimes uh, obsessed about their uh, practices. I think I am one of them. <laughs> I'm obsessed about what I do and I really believe in that. Vitamin D is one of them. The, the, there is so many patients I run the test their vitamin D comes not only in the lower end of the normal range, it's not even that, it's just low. And the reality for vitamin D is uh, for a lot of our patients, it's difficult to get the number from a lower level up to a good or uh, optimum number. Why? Because vitamin D is fat soluble. Not everyone digests and absorbs fat properly. Uh, imagine if there is a uh, pancreatic deficiency, if a person basically talks about, I have loose stool, or the stool floats, that just talking about the, the there is there's fat, it's undigested fat in the stool. So uh, if those are the case, then the vitamin D may not be absorbed properly. The other thing about vitamin D, and that is common, is just because it's a fat soluble, it should be taken with meal or after meal, and ideally after the largest meal of the day. So imagine if you are taking vitamin D early in the morning before breakfast, it just enters the body and leaves the other end. So that's how I say, like checking all, all these kind of uh, some probably maybe easy, but important uh, discussion. That's how we can optimize the vitamin D with vitamin D. Again, we had a session for vitamin D. It would be optim. It would be reasonable to add it with or combine it with vitamin K two. Um, so that will optimize the activation of the vitamin D, but also make sure that the uh, calcium that is absorbed through the digestive system sits in the right place, which is cal which is inside the bones, and is not sitting inside the walls of the arteries, which can end up with the atherosclerosis. So vitamin K two. Um, either your supplement is already D plus K2 or you're taking vitamin D, then that would be reasonable just to add K2, like 50 mcg or 100 mcg to, to that. So that's about the vitamin D. And uh, yeah, like uh, again, our practice uh, is the evidence-based practice. Um, this is what I promote. I am not the type of practitioner to say, you don't need to do the conventional treatment. You don't need to do the surgery. This is the thing. A lot of my patients say, should I do the surgery or not? I'm debating. Um, uh, uh, can what you do and the practices of natural uh, kill the cancer? So I always say, if there is a tumor, if there is a growth, there are two ways. Yes, um, either we want to use all our modalities and all the treatments that ideally will kill the cancer cells or another easy way, you surgically remove this and cut this out. So it will kind of save a lot of effort. It will save a lot of uh, kind of imagine treatments, number of treatments from IV, supplement, whatever that we do to say that now the surgery, that this the tumor has basically cleared. But again, at the very end, we will follow whatever is the decision of our patients. This is what I highlight. Yes, surgery can a lot of times, especially for the discussion of colorectal cancer, um, can be beneficial. And uh, the discussion after that, how should I proceed then? Yeah, we can, we can make a um, kind of discussion, but surgery to me, um, when when there is a lesion found, it is best to 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 get it out. The reality for the colorectal cancer is just because there's not usually many symptoms with the uh, with the growth of the bad cells in the body. Um, Thirty to forty percent of the cases are diagnosed when there are already metastasis, those distant metastasis to the liver, to the brain, to the lung, like common area, sometimes to the to the bones as well. So uh, that's the thing. Uh, 
if we know that it's there and before kind of uh, wasting time, that would be best to get it out. Now, chemotherapy, should we do or how should we do? That would be the next step. I just want to make some, leave some time for the questions. Um, so uh, again, I try to highlight that this is a collaborative approach. So it's not only one practitioner, you need, um, let's say your primary care, you need your oncologist, um, naturopathic doctor. A lot of times what we use at Naya is uh, the health coaches. And uh, this is like an advantage that we have at Naya and uh, the discussions about the diet, lifestyle changes, how it can be more practical, how I ca actually can um, kind of, it can help with my sweet tooth. I want to reduce the craving for sugar. So we have um, health coaches. I can actually sit with you uh, one by one and talk about, okay, what what would be a good grocery? What would be the, the benefit, like the important kind of things you can purchase? If you have a sweet tooth, maybe we can improve the protein intake, then your uh, spike of the uh, glucose will be minimum. So there are a lot of more practical uh, uh, things that will be discussed. And the good thing is we have those at Naya, whereas in a kind of meeting with your, let's say, uh, primary care or oncologist, uh, it may not be that much of time. So this is uh, all. And again, like we went on only very superficial about the uh, the discussion about the colorectal, but I'm happy if there's any question, you can put it in the chat or um, if you would like to unmute. Yes. So I basically give it back to Angela. Of course, yeah. So if anyone has any questions, you can use your hand raised feature there up in the corner with the three dots. Yes, please. Are there uh, symptoms that you've seen that are uh, as early warning signs that someone is developing a colorectal cancer? Uh, what what things should someone look for symptomatically? Right. Uh, thank you for the for the great question. So normally there are three A's that are discussed with oncology discussion. Like one is anemia. If there is a significant drop in the hemoglobin in the red blood cells in a test, or if the person just from uh, observation of the complexion is rather pale and it was not the case before. So there's a significant change that is usually one sign. The other is, refer another A is asthenia, like feeling tired, fatigue. And again, like everyone should be compared to his or her past. What was their energy level? Now it's significantly dropped. So that is another one. And then anorexia, like changes in the appetite. If it's a significant change, that would be, um, again, something to check. So this is like very general, but now coming to discussion about colorectal, we should consider the, uh, the, the bowel movement. So the changes that happens in the bowel movement. Um, uh, what is the caliber? Is it any change in the caliber? Is it rather thinner? Is it any uh, change in the habit? Is it more constipation? Is it more diarrhea? Like a lot of time it might be with a blockage that it can make, it can be constipation. So that would be another thing. And then um, like uh, some people do as uh, screening tests, like the fecal occult blood. So there are tests to say, to see if there is uh, bleeding, like when there's a cancer growing inside the GI system, anywhere it can it can end up with some blood uh, leaving the body through the feces so that is tested a lot of people just do it as a screening and uh, if um, again it is positive then that will be something to to further work up with uh, uh, colonoscopy and kind of um, further evaluation so Again, it's not very, it's not obviously as, as specific as the colonoscopy, but a lot of people who especially have had the colorectal cancer in their family members, because this can be like one type can be the hereditary uh, type of colorectal cancer. And um, with, with that, then that will be very wise, especially 
past age 50, or for some people even it can be earlier, uh, to do the regular screening checks uh, to make sure. But uh, if you say general discussion, yeah, like the regular bowel habits, that's uh, what we do for general health. We always, we evaluate that, ask many questions. Um, how is the flow? How many times per day? How many times per week? Is it with straining or not? And then always like we check, is there undigested food? Is there any, uh, does it float? As I said, like if there's a floating, it's just more fat particles in the inside the stool. So basically any significant change uh, with um, the habit or the caliber, uh, and uh, especially for a person with uh, a family history, someone in the family members, that would be um, something to follow up further, which is basically usually the colonoscopy. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sadril Sadat. Did anyone else have any questions? I am putting my email address in the chat here. So if anyone uh, would like a recording of this talk, you can shoot me an email at that address. We go. Yes, I have a question. You mentioned earlier about red meat. And so um, is that red meat altogether or uh, that we should minimize the amount of red meat that we consume or not consume it at all? And does it matter if the source of the red meat how the cow was raised or definitely so great question thank you uh for for red meat in general red meat can be uh, a discussion about inflammation like the 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 red meat uh is more inflammatory um in general so if you say uh for for like proteins definitely we need the proteins it can be from uh let's say uh, chicken from fish, uh, those type. And then what you mentioned in terms of, yeah, like, is there, um, uh, antibiotics? Are there hormones? Is it like grass fed? You know, all these kind of play a role. The, the other discussion about the, the meat in general is if this is burned, if this is burnt, like charred meat, like, like barbecue, uh, this is a direct link with the colorectal cancer. And, uh, again, um, this is one thing that is very interesting. I always say, if there are days that you don't have a great diet, if there are days that you have a barbecue and uh, definitely you may say there was something in the discussion that Dr. Payman said also that mentioned and now am I worried or not? Increase your antioxidants for that day, right? What are the antioxidants? You can increase your vitamin C level double, triple, you can increase the um, uh, green leafy vegetables. Um, if you like smoothie, just take one or two. And uh, this is life. We cannot uh, say that, yeah, we will never have any barbecue. It can happen definitely, but it's just how we can manage this out. So those days that we, our, our diet is not the best, increase your um, antioxidants because the, the red meat or the, the barbecue can increase the potential for oxidative stress. Now you are balancing this kind of potential with, with regular practices. Uh, make sure your hydration is good enough because uh, we are talking about how we can send stuff out of our body, right? So the, the flow of the body in terms of urine and the flow of the body in terms of defecation, sweating, these are all the discussions that we normally do. One more thing that I have to say about the antioxidants is the, um, and I recommend them for all my patients, is food sources uh, which are basically uh, green tea. If you if you prefer tea and you like tea, that would be at least one cup of green tea per day. If you prefer two, that would be still even better. The second thing is the berries. Uh, so I always say one cup of berries of any type that you like, blueberry, raspberry, strawberry, uh, but every day, because this is a great source of antioxidants. So Back to your discussion, yeah, like there might be days that uh, the, the meat, the red meat, and especially those kind of, the way that is prepared is higher, then we just manage it with uh, more antioxidants. All right, there, and Dr. Sidrosat, it looks like we have one last question in the chat here. Do you see that? 
Okay. So if, yes, if your colonoscopy found and removed precancerous polyps, what is recommended for the patient to mitigate progression into cancer GI? Simply advise to return in three years for cancer. So this is exactly, this is exactly where the practice of um, what we call like naturopathy, optimizing the body can, can help. Like there has been something found, there is a potential, there is a risk moving toward that, how we can make sure, let's say, as you said, in three years, we are we are um, supporting the body in healthy ways that it doesn't happen, right? Other than that, if you say, okay, I will meet you three in three years and uh, who knows what will happen if we are not really uh, monitoring. So that is the exact, like a great time for us to, to do some testing uh, again, like the, the meet and greet for all the basics and foundation and kind of clean the diet and any practices that can optimize the health. And uh, yes, this is, there's is a lot that can be done in that, in that very specific time period. Thank you for your great question. All right. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, everyone, it looks like we are wrapped up here. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for Dr. Thank you, Dr. Zadrol Sadat for such an amazing talk. Um, we do have another talk next week. So watch for your newsletter on spring detox next Wednesday at the same time, 2 to 3 p.m. with Dr. Sarah Banha. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.